Kevin, great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Before we dive into everything proof and what you're building in the NFT space, I wanted to start with a question about collectibles. Uh, you've always been into collecting art, watches, memorabilia. What are some of the things that you're collecting right now? Oh, gosh. I mean, I would say I've, I've tried to probably pare back that amount of stuff over time. Um, it's easy to get carried away and you go down these rabbit holes. Like, I think my brain kind of works by just really wanting to learn anything and everything about a given topic and if, if, if that it leads to some type of collectible object. Like, you know, I remember with the early days of watches, it wasn't that I wanted a Rolex. It was more that I just wanted to go and learn about the small independent watchmakers and especially around a lot of the um, still handmade uh, Japanese watches that are still being done. And, mm. and, and in Switzerland, there's a few um, like Philippe Dufour and a few others that are, are still doing it, you know, by hand. Uh, and their wait lists are like 20 years long. And so the, just like these oh. these ideas of like these dying crafts are kind of like really cool to me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's what kind of hooks me in. And then I'd say in terms of stuff that I collect these days, you know, I, I've kind of realized that I don't need more stuff. So for me, it's like taking and paring down to like the absolute essentials of what I want to have. Uh, and hold on to. So, um, you know, that's like, uh, you know, I have like one basketball card and I have like, uh, like five comics or whatever, you know? So it's, it's just kind of, um, just making sure it doesn't run away from me, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. So you're into trading cards? Yeah. I mean, I've, I was always into trading baseball cards when I was much younger. And that was kind of a, a big thing for me, you know, as a kid, just growing up and going to like baseball card shops and things like that. And, I got into football as well and basketball, of course, um, growing up and, you know, catching Jordan's kind of like, you know, heyday as a young kid. Mm. And um, so, you know, when you, when you get a little bit older, you, obviously the nostalgia kicks in and you're like, okay, maybe I should go back in and own one of these. And I remember Gary V telling me maybe five or six years ago to go pick up a Jordan rookie card. And so um, I, I picked up a Jordan rookie card before the prices went crazy. Yeah, uh, which was pretty awesome. And then it's just like other stuff was like, um, you know, I have like the first X Men and the first Spider Man, and it's not that I, I want to get like perfect condition versions of these because they're the perfect condition ones are just insane prices. Mm -hmm. I just want a example of one, you know. So mine aren't like super highly rated, but it's like, you know, it's it's just very cool to be able to pull those out and look at them from time to time and just be kind of transported back to um, what comic books were like back then. Definitely. Um, talking about collectibles, obviously, like we segue into, you know, what we're both kind of passionate about, which is the world of NFTs and all that. I was just wondering how you're thinking about collectibles and, you know, the years to come, if ever there, we reach a point where like these collectibles are tokenized and you can just redeem it as a physical object. Do you think there's still going to be concepts like PSA, like conditions of certain things? Yeah, I mean, I, when I think about something like a PSA, I mean, most likely, um, you know, I, it's my belief that those will probably no longer exist and be done at the manufacturer level, mm. um, just because there'll be no need for a middle party. You know, we'll want proven, pr uh, perfect uh, provenance from the manufacturer themselves. Mm. And so, you know, an example of that would be like, in a future world, 10 years from now, or whatever it ends up taking, a baseball card will be released as a, the manufacturer will print them and say, okay, we made a thousand of this particular rookie card. You know, 157 of them came out as perfect tens. We've put them in, encapsulated them and are, and are storing them in perfect condition. And here's the digital representation of that particular type. Mm. If you want to redeem it, you can burn that NFT, we'll take it in and we'll send you and ship to you the actual physical version of that. If not, you know, you can keep it stored here and you'll have the ability to resell that NFT to someone else without ever having that actual item ship or be moved. The art world does this already where they take, they have massive warehouses where art is stored and, mm -hmm. you know, just kept in Switzerland and kept, you know, oftentimes in these areas that are tax-free regions and, you know, art buyers will, will take possession of a new piece of art and never having ac actually seen it or looked at it. And it'll just sit there and remain in the same warehouse, right? So mm. it's, it's not uncommon to, to have these types of transactions happen even, even already without the blockchain. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I want to say to you, like, congrats on the recent launch of Moonbird Mythics. Uh, the art oh, and thank the, you. the storytelling, the art are absolutely on point. We see the IP being built step by step where, you know, pieces of the puzzle um, start forming the bigger picture. Can you tell us a bit more about this collection and how it fits into the broader proof ecosystem? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the Mythics for us, we always wanted to do a, a kind of follow-up collection to Moonbirds. And uh, we had done a collection with Gremlin, but that really wasn't our, you know, homegrown collection. That was uh, the oddities were just something that Gremlin had created and and launched as a fun free giveaway that we did shortly after we launched Moonbirds. And so, you know, Moonbirds for us was an, a, a chance to go out and just really experiment with what was possible during that time. When when it launched, you know, shortly thereafter, we were in something that people were calling CC Zero Summer, which was this idea that. Creative Commons um, artwork could spread far and wide by the memification of art and this idea of the remix culture and people creating derivative projects based on the original. And so, you know, we saw that happen many times over. I mean, because mm. probably close to a hundred different kind of, you know, Moonbirds-esque projects that freely were able to use the IP and, and spread, um, you know, the project around. Uh, this go around, you know, we wanted to extend the ecosystem with higher fidelity art. So the first time around, it was, you know, very much 8-bit style art, something higher f fidelity, something that um, were the actual uh, people that collected and held the NFTs would fully own the IP in a non-revocable way. Not even we could take the rights away from them, which I think is essential given a lot of the collections still have the ability to to remove the rights. Mm. And you know, we just wanted to have an experiment of what it would be like if we could create a community of people that were builders. And so for us, you know, we have kind of Moonbirds being the collectors PFP, meaning people that are really into collecting NFTs and art. Um, and we wanted to lean into this idea of building and seeing what we can do. Um, and we're just at the early stages of all this, but you'll see a lot of these kind of guilds form around the different traits and and much like uh, our parliaments formed around the different moonbird collections for various reasons and different kind of initiatives uh you'll probably see the smaller sub communities forming around the mythics as well and also do a lot more storytelling on that side of the house mm -hmm. and lean into it you know we've done some animated shorts that have done quite well so you you'll probably see us doing more dabbling and experimentation in that area as well yeah what i really like are the, are the mechanics of being able to choose which mythic you'll bring to life with the hatching of the eggs and all that it really gives the holder the opportunity to pick a mythic that represents them and to participate in the creation slash curation of the collection. As far as like decentralized storytelling goes, how do you see this playing out with mythics in the broader proof ecosystem? Yeah, uh, it, it's a great question. I, I think that part of what we want to do with some of these smaller subgroups inside of mythics is really kind of deputize and figure out who are the creatives amongst us that can go and do great things? And we've already seen, I mean, animators come in and already animate some of the mythic collections to make the traits dance and do crazy mm -hmm. things and really high fidelity, not just someone messing around in Photoshop, but like real, you know, professional animators come in and make these things come alive. And so, you know, when we think about what this means for the storytelling aspects, we know there are folks on that side of the house as well that just want a shot at you know, potentially having a say in the direction and lore and where we take this. You know, we worked with the animation studio to create those first couple shorts that, you know, I, I would argue that anyone could look at those and say that could easily be an animated series on, you know, Netflix or any other big major network, given the high quality nature of, of, of what was produced there. So, you know, when we do things like that going forward, if that turns into a bigger piece of what we do as a collection, then certainly we'll want to lean on the community to play a role in that. Because I think it's the community aspect of this, especially in Web3, it's so very important. And it also, you know, you're creating your best kind of brand advocates when you when you get people involved in in the actual creation of the future of the project. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's really where you build the loyalty. And 100%. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've been really enjoying is seeing the BTS content that the Proof team has been putting out. You know, a lot of times, Holders of project don't really know what's going on internally. And when you're balancing like lore, excitement versus setting expectations, I think this format is perfect to share the work that's being done without giving away too much. Do you think this transparency will be a requisite for most projects moving forward? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a great question. I, you know, I, one of the things that we realized is that 
in the world of Web3, it's an environment that just is moving so fast. And it's like you always have to kind of be telling your story or retelling your story over and over again. And if you're not, you know, somebody else is kind of filling that void for you. Mm. And if there's dead space and empty air and, uh, you know, it takes time to obviously build. So if there's months that go by between uh, product iterations or releases, you know, you should be out there front and center. And you can do that in a whole variety of different ways. And, you know, we decided to kind of let people know because, you know, there's, of course, you see all the different chatter that happens on Twitter or X or whatever. And, and people yeah. respond and they say, oh, you know, you're doing, you're not doing this. And how do you have this team, but nobody's really working on X, Y, or Z or, you know, sometimes the days they love you, some days they're in the middle and some days they, they, they think you're rugging them, right? So it's kind of all over the place in Web3. But when you, when you fire up a camera and you show the humans behind this and you show a team of, you know, dozens of people that are just like spending, doing their life's work, like building out these experiences and putting in, you know, a lot of blood, sweat and tears over many months to make this a reality, it, it really takes out a lot of that the mystery and it, it really lets people know that like, hey, this isn't just somebody saying they're going to do something, but they're actually, you know, really putting in the effort. Mm -hmm. which I think goes a long way because, you know, quite frankly, there are a lot of, given this is cryptocurrency and the things that we've seen over the last few years in terms of, you know, uh, FTX and a whole slew of different things, you never know what's going to happen or who's doing what with the resources and, and funds that have been, you know, allocated towards their organization. So I, I think just showing who we are behind the scenes gives it a little humanity and lets people know, uh, put a kind of a, a face to it all, which I think is quite nice. And for sure, it's fun for you guys too, because, you know, I'm sure you're going to look back at this in like 10 years and you'll be like, no, for it's sure. so cool to have th all this documented. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. We have so much footage that, you know, a lot of it hasn't even been put out yet. And, and it's kind of fun to look back at, you know, I remember when we were talking about like choosing, Justin and I were debating out like, you know, the eggs hatching and like choosing one of the, one of the mythics. And, you know, that was done probably eight months ago, you know? And so mm. it's like some early, early footage of stuff that like, maybe not eight months ago, but definitely at least six months ago. And it was like some, some early footage of stuff that uh, we'll just look back and we have captured and saved and, you know, may not see the light of day, but we'll, we'll have it and put it online at some point. Yeah. How did you come up with the name Proof, by the way? Did you, did you have other names in consideration or did you just like, that was like a name. Uh, I think it was just a lot of, um, there was a lot of people using like proof of this, proof of that, and, you know, proof of stake and proof of work. And I just thought it would just be a, I, I'm a big fan of like very simple names, like the things that projects like uh, I built in the past have been, you know, like proof and oak and zero and dig and pounce and, you know, just things that are just like, Single words, uh, not a whole lot of syllables, just like really, really kind of something, mm. you know, that's easy to grok. And uh, this just check those boxes. Looking back at the initial launch of Proof Collective, I feel like the magnitude of what can be accomplished here is much greater than what you initially foresaw. Maybe you can correct me on that if that's not right. But how did the success or scale of Moonbirds and Mythics impact your initial plan? or vision of the project because it's now a 10k plus community versus what was originally like thought out as like a 1k community. Yeah, you know, it's um hmm I think that anyone that says in the early days we weren't just kind of kind of figuring out this out in real time. I think we were all like that as For projects. Sure. And and when when we launched um Moonbirds I remember it was just because we're like, ah, nobody really wants to use those proof passes as their PFP. Let's just do something fun. And we wanted to launch them and have a handful of like little utilities that would go along with them. Um, but it was never like, we never really expected them to be that big. Like we, we never really expected them to go and kind of like see the volume that we saw over that, that year post launch, you know, of, of people trading them and how, how you know somebody paid a million dollars for a single one and it was just like crazy mm. um and so it just goes to show you kind of a lot of it was right place right time but i wouldn't even say that like in some sense it was kind of um wrong time uh because <laughs> yes. it, it's it's like you don't want to to live up to that hype is just so impossible mm -hmm. it's just impossible and so we learned a lot i i think it's you know that that was um 
we didn't really expect it to be as crazy and demanding. And so we went from this kind of nimble company that was putting out things and launching things with a few people to being like, holy hell, we, like, we really need to staff up here because the demands are quite substantial and we don't want to do anything half-ass, you know? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we got some kind of initial pushback on is, you know, we canceled like things like, you know, Project High Rise, which we were developing for a few months and some other stuff that we were kind of working on because it didn't meet our bar and our own internal bar of, of quality. It was kind of like all hands on deck. Let's figure this out. Um, and we had some great stuff that we shipped and some, some stuff that was just, you know, kind of fell flat, but it's, it's challenging when you, when you, when you start with like three or four people and then, you know, you have to scale to 20, 30 people in, you know, under a year mm -hmm. just to get the right people, to get them to gel and to get everyone to kind of like, you know, be on the same team and get to know each other and the onboarding process. And I mean, there's everything from payroll to insurance to taxes to, you know, all the things that you have to do um, right. as a business. And it's, it was just a massive effort to, to pull that off. I've never had to grow a business that quickly. Typically, it's <laughs> like you get going, you, you're kind of like your first year is like, can we find, find product market fit? And then you do, and then it kind of slowly starts to take, and then you know things start to catch fire. But you're, you've already kind of built the, the foundation for those next stages. And in this case, like we skipped the foundation altogether. It was just like all hands on deck, like everything's on fire in like month two, you know, right? which is an awkward place to be as, a, as an entrepreneur. You know, a lot of people don't have the precedent or the context of what you were doing in the space at that time. You were having your podcast, Modern Finance, and you were talking about this stuff for a while just because it was personal, I guess, like curiosity and interest. And then you launched Proof Collective, which was a way for you to bring like a thousand person collective that's really interested in art. And mm -hmm. I think now with the way that these things are developing, I feel like you can make a way bigger dent than you initially expected just because of the size of the community. And also just this, I guess, the evolution of the technology too. Like we're, we're not just talking about more art collecting in the traditional sense, but it's also like democratizing that art collecting that anybody that gets into the space can collect something for you know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, or 100 bucks. Like, I, I feel like that's what's really exciting right now. How do you see that evolving in the, in the following months or years? Do you see us getting some velocity in the more mainstream consumer side? Yeah, I mean, I, that's the hope. I, I, I think it, you kind of nailed it in that, you know, if you're going to be a collector of art and you wanted to find like the, when we talked about earlier about the different types of collectibles that were, that were out there, mm -hmm. you know, and like ones that we grew up with, whether it be like baseball cards or, or watches or comic books or you name it, they all had different price entry points. Right. And so, you know, I was just looking the other day, like a, a Steph Curry rookie card, like perfectly graded from not that long ago, obviously, uh, is like tens of thousands of dollars, right. To get mm -hmm. like an, an original perfect Steph Curry. And so, the cool thing about that, though, is like if you had the the foresight and the knowledge to say, hey, there's something special going on with this kid, you could have purchased one of those cards that, you know, anyone, uh, not anyone, but people with enough means, call it, you know, a few hundred dollars, could have gone and gotten a perfect example of that. Or, you know, I, I don't know what they're trading for back then, but it, it was next to nothing, right? Mm. And that's like the beauty of, um, and it's very different than like watches and fine art where, you know, it's like you have to start at a price point that is unattainable for so many people, right? Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about NFTs is that because there isn't the overhead of having to have a gallery to show them or, you know, the shipping a painting or whatever it may be, it cuts out a lot of that and allows these artists to really kind of innovate and ship with a, at times a pretty, you know, inexpensive price point for people to get involved. One of the reasons why I collected on Tezos early on with, um, you know, Hen and some of the other platforms that were on, on Tezos is that they were just so approachable. It was like, kind of like the indie platform. Oh, it's so fun. It's so fun because you could go in there and like for, you know, 20, 30 bucks, you could find something awesome. And then if it blew up and they became the next William Upon, which had some st early stuff on there, you know, uh, it was worth thousands. Or like uh, Lucrece or... Yeah, Lucrece was early on there. And there was a, a handful of them that that started on there. John with all the J's and 
And I think that's the cool thing about the blockchain is we're going to see, you know, these up and coming artists that say, hey, I'll give this a shot. I'll try these NFT thing, this NFT thing out. And I'm going to sell my first uh, few pieces for for dollars, you know, just to see if there's an appetite for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's actually the case. If you look at like some very old X copies that are now worth over a half million dollars a piece, those original sales were a couple hundred bucks, you know, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't it wasn't anything crazy. And so it just I love that about this space, right? It, It does democratize things a lot. You don't have to wait. Nobody waited for Christie's to, to, or Sotheby's uh, to deputize something and say, you are an artist. Mm. And, and, you know, in, before it was worth something, right? Like, and that's, that's the case with all the kind of, I would consider blue chip artists in, in the space. They don't need these traditional art houses to be successful, right? Right. Um, they have their fans online. They're digitally native fans that are already there built in. And it, it's not to say that those Christie's or Sotheby's isn't doing uh, a fantastic job for the space because I love the fact that they're bringing in traditional collectors, right? They're bringing in their uh, Rolodex of people that are all the old school, you know, um, canvas collectors and saying, hey, pay attention to this digital stuff now. These are the important artists that you should. So it's, it's, a, it's a win-win, I think, in, when in, terms, in terms of working with them to, to help them actually validate and bring in new collectors to the space. Yeah, I've listened to your past... Um 100 proof podcast with uh, uh michael yeah right uh yeah he was mentioning that like a, a lot of these like traditional art collectors are are very open to the idea of generative art and all that mm-hmm. yeah i love it it's a brand new vertical for them to collect you mentioned in a recent interview with gq3 that you know most of these whether it's big luxury or fashion brands think very long term they realize that you know right now in the nft space it's the best time to experiment collect data how do you personally keep a long-term vision and navigate a market where you have to plan for weeks and not necessarily for months or years? Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. I think that's you probably hit on the the kind of crux of the problem with building in the public eye, right? Like mm-hmm. it's because you you've got a, a a hungry audience that says when when's the next drop? When's when the next drop? crazy thing? Yeah, when's the when's the next crazy thing you're going to do? Well, at the same time, you have to say, okay, well. Let's make sure that we're we're kind of you know taking our time and that we believe that this market uh, it's I, I'm of the belief that there's no such thing as just an overnight multi billion dollar company it just doesn't happen like it takes time for these markets to mature and actually that's what we're seeing right now this this major correction is a correction back to something normal and then there'll be slow growth from there and I honestly think it's a healthy thing like it's this idea that we were just going to go up and to the right forever is not the reality of any any collectible market, right? Mm. And I just, um, you know, for me, I I see that as a time to go heads down, a time to build, and and really just kind of stay focused on on what we believe to be true. And and I can tell you with absolute certainty that I my core belief has always been that you know NFTs are going to have a variety of applications. Art is probably going to be one of the largest, like just the category of you know, contemporary art coming to the blockchain is going to be massive and new types of art that we ha- can't, you know, build, uh, you know, out in the real world, meaning art that changes and evolves over time or, you know, has an internet connectivity to do new and unique things. And mm. so there's just, there's a lot of um, exciting new avenues to take this. And it, for us, it's just going to be, we know to win is, is not to like just focus on one big splash, but just to, go heads down and consistently show up, you know, week over week, month over month. And then eventually people will look and say, Hey, they've done some high quality work here, you know? And it's kind of like, it's what we're doing with grails right now. We're just, uh, you know, did a bunch of our minting open up today, uh, went really well. A lot of people minted. We had, they had more mints in the first day today than we ever had in all four of the grail seasons. Yeah. Um, which was a great sign. And you know, we got the reveal coming in the end of this week. It's going to be, it's going to be a ton of fun. I'm into the doom piece. Oh, awesome. Yeah. T- speaking about grails, when uh, K roll grail? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, we've had, we've had Alexis and we've had some Gary V and a few others and Tim. So I guess I, 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 I should do something at some point, but um, I don't know. I, I'd rather, I, there's so much to do on the, on the actual business building side. <laughs> So I, I saw you on your IG that you've been posting actually like um, a bit of photos uh, taken with your Leica camera and Pixel. Like it, 
Is photography something you're keen on developing more in the future? Yeah, I mean, I so yes, yeah, yeah. So here's my my baby right here. This nice. is a, a, a M6, which is a, a film film camera, and uh, yeah. So for me, you know, there's something ninety nine point nine percent of the time my um, my iPhone's going to do just fine. But uh, you know, there's two reasons I like um, the, the the Leicas. One uh, on the film side, it's it's really fun. Uh, it's like a surprise. It's like opening up a, a, a pack of cards or something like, you know, mm-hmm. for the first time when you were a kid, like I went to, um, uh, Tokyo recently with a buddy of mine and he, he was shooting with on his, like on his M6 on, in black and white. And he came back and, and developed the film and the, the pictures turned out like super grainy and awesome and just like so vintagey looking. And it was just like beautiful stuff. So I, I, I love that. And I also like, uh, on the digital side, like it puts out the, um, the monochrome series of cameras where they custom build a, a sensor that is only monochrome. So you have no, you can't even shoot in color if you wanted to. Okay. Okay. Um, so those are, those are fun. And so for me, it's like, if you're going to have something that, you know, uh, analog like that, it's, it's important to get off the phone sometimes and just to force yourself to take a minute to like look in and, you know, shut your, set your sh- shutter speed and then, uh, adjust the aperture it's like you know that's that's just like i don't know you, you need that time off the off the off the phone you know there's a mechanic feeling to it that is very hard to you know very hard to appreciate if you're just on your phone because on your phone like you can take like thousands of pictures like just by pressing the button and mm-hmm. then you see all of them like there's so much quantity of content that you don't appreciate that specific moment that you captured mm-hmm. that's so, exactly right so I'm a photographer myself, but I've been trying to do more and more of a film photography too, just because yeah, of that ritual. Awesome. Yeah, a buddy of mine was telling me, and I, this is my first role that I'm putting through this camera here, but like a buddy of mine was telling me that he sends it to a development house that they just send you back your negatives and just, just high resolution digital files. Yeah. So yeah. like you just like get, which is amazing. Like, I mean, I knew that was a service that you could add on, but like that's the default now. So like, you send in your film, you get back digital files that go right into your, you know, right into, um, into your iPhoto or whatever you're storing them in and you're good to go. Which yeah, is you don't cool. need to be in that red room anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Or even do the conversion scanning or anything, you know, it's all done. Right. I've been, been following your content for a while um, with the Kevin Rose show, the random show with Tim Ferriss, Foundation, Modern Finance. Just seems to me like you have a certain ease when it comes to interviewing guests. Uh, did did you always have this knack with communication from an early age, or is it something that you developed? Oh my god, no! Throughout your career. Oh uh, well, I appreciate you saying that. I think it's um, it's still a work in progress. I, uh, for me, it's I the people the thing that people most people don't know is I'm naturally a pretty introverted type person. I was at a, a friend's birthday party last night. Um, someone that that we know. Uh, pretty well. And, and and she invited us over and I didn't know anyone at the party. And there was like 40 people there. And I looked over to my wife and I'm like, how do we talk to people? Like, what, what, do, what do we, what do we say? Like, where, where should we walk up? Like, what's a good, you know, icebreaker to like meet new people? Cause we just moved out to LA not too long ago, you know? And I was like, we should make some friends. Like, how do, how do we, what do we say? You know? And so, you know, I, I tried it a few times, walked up to a few people and, and said a few things, but like, I'm just like, for some reason, I have like a mode when a camera comes on, I can kind of turn it on. Mm. And then I just, I think the other big thing is that one of the things I, I, I was very fortunate enough to grow up in, in the Bay Area and be surrounded by a lot of entrepreneurs. And so, you know, when I had, whether it be Jack Dorsey or Ev Williams or Elon Musk or any of the big greats on my podcast in the past, they were friends, but they were also just like, you realize that when you work with these people, they're very sharp, of course, like sharp entrepreneurs, insanely sharp, but they're also human. Like they make mistakes, they mess mm-hmm. up, they make wrong product decisions, they roll them back, they have to issue apologies. Like they're, nobody's going to have like this perfect, and, and once you kind of realize that, you're like, oh, you're just like, you're just a normal human like me. And, and then and then all of the anxiety around, oh my gosh, I'm sitting down with Elon Musk goes away. Mm. And you can just like have a normal conversation and be like, hey, Elon, like what comic books did you read growing up? You know, which was actually one of the questions I asked him. And he was a huge comic fan. And he went off for like 10 minutes about his favorite comic books, you know, and it was just <laughs> like, you know, that type of stuff where it just, it, it, it can be a more natural conversation versus something that's totally scripted. And 
I used to have all my notes and everything and be like, okay, yeah, this is the question. And this is, and those are good to like have a high level of kind of where you want to take things. Mm. But at the end of the day, I think the best stuff is just the stuff that just is like super casual. Like if you like, if you were sitting down with, with a, a friend for a, a beer or something, you know? Yeah. Right. That, that, that's why, like, I think the random show with Tim works so well. Cause it's just, yeah. you guys like riffing. Oh, we're, we're friends. excited. Tim just hit me up a couple of days ago and, and we're going to do a live South by Southwest show this, this coming year. Oh, uh, no um, way. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, so we're probably going to have like an, a venue that has a, holds a few thousand people and just do a, a crazy, crazy show. So I can't wait. Looking forward to that. I'll be there. Awesome. It should be fun. I mean, I'm shifting topics left and right here, but since we're talking about things that are not necessarily related to like proof or NFTs and all that, I know you're big into health and wellness. Uh, you're an avid meditator, right? Can you tell us a bit more about your meditation practice? Because I know you mentioned it a couple of times on a Tim uh, Tim's random show, but never went into like full detail about how you go about it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been um, a very important part of, of my life, at least for the last, um, I'd say, uh, two and a half years or so. And I think there's, um, I think with meditation, there are so many different ways to go and, and, and dabble in this arena. You know, I was, uh, I remember when, when calm first or not calm, what, when headspace first came out as an app, mm. you know, maybe, gosh, I didn't even, I can't even tell you now, maybe 15 years ago or something like that. A long time ago, it was like very early, you know, iOS app, like for meditation. And I was drawn into it. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Cause I had read some books on meditation. And then I got really lucky because there was a San Francisco Zen center, which was right next to my house in San Francisco which was a very famous Zen center. And it was actually the one that Steve Jobs used to meditate at way back in the day, which is crazy when he lived in SF, huh. uh, which it's, a, it's right there on Page Street. If you ever want to uh, find yourself in San Francisco, it's a beautiful building. It's worth chop, um, you know, stepping into the bookstore there and whatnot and just checking it out. But, um, you know, there's, I would say that I, I dabbled in that, like, I would do that, like, okay, 10 minutes, like sit down and do the 10 minutes, you know? I now realize that is like fantastic for like stress reduction and just kind of like just a, a moment of to pause and just like kind of take some me time, you know, things like that. But I wouldn't consider that a serious meditation practice. Mm. That's a, that's a very kind of like commercial meditation practice, you know, and I don't mean that's a bad thing for 99.9% .9 of people. That's probably going to be amazing and have fantastic benefits on a, on a variety of different fronts. I started taking it seriously during COVID. And that's when I, I picked up a, a version of Zen called Sambo Zen, mm. um, which is a very contemporary kind of non-religious version of Zen. Um, it was started in Japan. And I was introduced to a, a, an instructor called Henry Shookman, uh, who's a Zen master that lives out in the United States and started studying underneath him. And that's when I really started to take it seriously and said, okay, I'm going to go for it. Go for it, meaning like I want to experience, I, I want to take this practice seriously enough to give myself a shot at different types of consciousness that come with in, like people that take meditation seriously. And they'll, they have many different words for this type of state that you can enter into. But more seriously, meaning like you spend more time just sitting or? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it comes down to spending more time sitting, also working with an instructor to help you, to help like, I would say, fine tune your practice. It's like little, just like little tweaks here and there of like, oh, have mm. you considered it? So I, I work on something called, in, in, in Zen, they have these things called koans, which are these these little questions that that are, don't really have answers so you know uh, the one you'll hear probably the most famous one is like the sound of one hand clapping right like yeah the, the, those are those are japanese koans and where or like your face before your parents were born or something that's like right that. that's right exactly that's another very famous one and so you know there's hundreds of them right there's like 500 and some or something like that and so uh they all have you know they're all answerable in front of a Zen master. And so, but you have to be able to, um, this is all, this is all going to sound crazy. I'm not really sanctioned to be able to talk about this type of stuff, but like you, you practice to where you ob obtain these states of consciousness that were these, these, there will be answers for these, these types of questions. And that's what I'm kind of going after. And so for me, that means a minimum of 25 minutes a day on the cushion and hopefully 55 minutes. So, uh, mm. two 25s and a five minute walking, and then at least one seven day silent retreat per year, hopefully two, um, nice. which is just nonstop, uh, meditation for, for seven full days. Um, so, you know, it's, 
they say to to kind of get to that that world and to have a shot at it, you know, you need uh, anywhere from five to twenty five years of, of solid practice to pull that off. And um, I haven't obviously obtained any type of enlightenment or any type of awakening in any way. But I will I will say that I can tell you at once you kind of hit that twenty plus minute mark, it certainly does. It, it's like that lighter version that you were doing at ten minutes with calmer headspace amplified by like 10x. So the the, the mm. returns are, are much greater in terms of just the way you carry yourself and the way that you react to things. There was two days ago, I was standing in front of Target um, outside waiting for an Uber and two guys started to get into a fight right, right in front of me. Mm-hmm. And one guy pulls out Mace and Mace is the other guy in the face. And this is like five feet away from me. And they start fist fighting and like they were like falling into the side. And, and, and like, my reaction was like so weird. It was like I didn't have the this like fight or flight. It was just like a sense of calm, and I was just like, okay, well, how do I separate them? And like everyone else is freaking <laughs> out, freaking out around me. And the only thing I can attribute it to is just sitting on the cushion and just kind of just being like, not really. My reaction brain isn't hitting as hard as it used to. Like it's not like, which is actually really good for business too, because yeah, um, it, it's like. The comments don't sting as hard because, you know, at the end of the day, you say, well, I, did I put in a full day's w- worth of work and give it my all and give it my best effort? And if the answer is yes, you, you can sleep pretty well because you just can't, can't please everyone on that front. But anyway, a long story short is I, I really love Zen. I, I think it's, mm. that for me, it's been, um, it, it's such a simple practice, you know, and there's just, there's not a whole lot to it, but that's kind of the point. Mm-hmm. And, um, if you put the time on the cushion, it's it's a beautiful thing. So what did you say to that to those two guys fighting? Yeah. Uh, they ended up breaking it up themselves. I just wanted to make sure that someone w- really wasn't hurting the other person. I really didn't want to get sprayed with mace, and they were kind of more wrestling than they were hurting each other. And I was like, okay, nobody like shank somebody with a knife or something else, you know. You came up to and, them and then you hit them with like, what's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just stunned them both in their tracks. <laughs> no, there was none of that, but it was, um, it was definitely, um, yeah, it just kind of uh, dissipated, and they both went their separate ways, which I was thankful for. No, oh, it's it's been um, tremendous for me too. So I've been meditating ever since I was like fifteen, just because uh, one of my family members, my aunt, she taught me how to meditate. She was mm. really into that stuff like early on. And um, I guess like it's always shifted from, you know, Vipassana kind of meditation mm-hmm. to to uh, eventually I stumbled into Zen as well. Mm. A, a book that I really liked was The Three Pillars of Zen. Three Pillars, by fantastic Ka- book. Kaplo, yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's a great book. And so are you uh, Renzai sect or what What? What style are you? Are, are you just uh, Renzai. Kind of, yeah. Okay, sweet. Uh, so you study koans as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've studied them, but by myself. So that I think that the next yeah. step would really to have like a, a certain, a real instructor to guide me on those things. Because all these things are so elusive, right? Like mm-hmm. you can put them in writing, but like it, it all depends on your personal uh, interpretation of them. And then you can sit, you know, let's say you're sitting and you're meditating for like 30, 40 minutes. You can have a very trance-like experience. And then you mm-hmm. think like you're enlightened and then you, mm-hmm. you, you, you start like chasing that high, you know? You and can't then chase moment, it; it'll, go, it'll disappear. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's you're, you're doing that. You're getting that samadhi type experience, which is not enlightenment, but it's a very deep state of concentration, and and it's a beautiful thing to be in. Mm-hmm. But uh, have you looked up like states of samadhi and things like that? And and it's 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 a it's it, for me they they rarely come. They're a gift when they come, but they, if the second you try and chase them, <laughs> they, boom, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, you just look at them wrong, and they take off. Yeah, yeah, you're like, oh, this is nice. Let yeah, me try oh, to. <laughs> there it goes. Yeah, coming back to a little bit about like NFTs and and everything happening in space. You know, we're at a moment in time where technology is challenging the traditional art landscape in many ways. What are some actions that you think we can collectively take to move the needle in order to get more collectors and artists to join the space? Is it just a question of time, or is there things that we can yeah. actively do? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, how much can we lift up and amplify the artists that we love? You know, and I think one of the things that we we care a lot about at Proof is is really our team around storytelling. One of the the kind of things that Ma- Ma- Mauricio, who runs the media team at Proof and who does, you know, all of the Grails media and, and does that storytelling piece, one of the things that we've talked about in the past and that he's so good at is can we create a piece of video? 
that's an hour long, that tells the story of 20 artists that if you don't even know what an NFT is, you can sit down and be excited enough and blown away by the art enough to just sit there and watch the whole thing. And then at the end, say to yourself like, damn, how do I collect some of these artists, right? Mm. And like, we try to uh, take away all the crazy technical terms and extract away all the kind of chaos of NFTs. And, you know, we don't talk about wallets or weird things. We're just like showing great art and telling fantastic stories. And the more of that we can do, like the better place I think we're going to be. And so, you know, I love these, these people like Cosmo and some of the others, um, big collectors that go out there and they, they take the time to like, you know, multiple times a week where they'll, they'll say, here's my up and coming artist of the week. And this mm -hmm. is somebody doing something really cool. And like that to me is how we bring in, you know, these, these collectors is by showing them that this isn't just commodity trading. This isn't just how can you make five X in two weeks? Mm -hmm. This is about, you know, humans behind the scenes here that are actually producing beautiful things that are, hasn't been possible before. Right. Right. And so, um, that's, that's the exciting piece. I don't know that I have a perfect answer for you other than I know what I know how to do personally, which is, you know, the media piece that hopefully we can lean into more of and just continue to tell these stories. And I'm hoping this is going to be a cyclical market that like we've seen with cryptocurrency, where the next time we see, you know, the tide rise, it's higher than the last time, right? And we bring in more exciting people and the narrative shifts away from this being scammers and a difficult to use, um, you know, place to it being more about, wow, art is moving on the blockchain and this is a durable thing that is, that they can understand the value in, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. And I, I like the ethos that you form with proof early on and eventually with the uh, Moonbirds as being the art collector's PFP because because of the collective, personally, I've been introduced to amazing artists I would have never heard about on my own. And you're positioning yourself as a media company, making content uh, to educate people and bring more exposure to, to these artists. And I draw a parallel here with uh, Houdinki, which you, know, mm -hmm. you were the CEO of, because you guys did kind of like a similar thing where mm -hmm. you were creating content around timepieces to establish the brand as a leader in the market. Do you see traditional art players coming to proof for advice on entering the space or what's happening with NFTs and all that? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of the bigger houses, like we've done a collaboration with Pace Gallery and, <clears throat> you know, we've had, <clears throat> excuse me, conversations with a lot of the big, um, you know, some big athletic brands, uh, other big galleries. There's a bunch of people that are NFT curious and they just like kick in the tires and they say, hey, tell me more. Maybe we could do something small to kind of put our toe in the water and see if there's anything here. And so I've been really inspired by the last year of that, you know, seeing some of the big names out there, whether it be Louis Vuitton or Gucci or other big brands come mm -hmm. in, Adidas and Nike and, and them doing these drops. Um, it, it's, it's great. And it, and it, I think it's, um, you know, I think about the, the early Hodinkee days, it, it was storytelling and it was also, you know, making sure that that media existed where people wanted to consume it. So, you know, we had some fantastic editorial uh, folks uh, and, and Ben, the founder, being one of the best and then moving that into, in, you know, building mobile experiences for that. So first thing I did when I got to Hodinkee was build our mobile apps because they, they mm -hmm. had none, right? So we, we built out an iOS app and, and got it on Android and um, we just build out all the e-commerce components as well and enabled Apple Pay and like all these things so we could actually reach the consumer where they were. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, you know, a lot of these consumers and collectors, especially at the high end of art, are going to be at these and have relationships with these traditional um, galleries. And so working with them is going to be essential. I saw today that uh, PayPal announced the launch of their US dollar stable coin. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, you know, I don't, I don't really know. It's, it was all very confusing to me. Like, I'm not sure why the world needs more stable coins. Um, you know, we have USDC, which seems to be, it, it works quite well and it has, you know, Coinbase and, and oh, I forget the other folks that are behind it, but, uh, you know, we've got Tether on the more international side that really can't be shut down, buying a ton of bonds. And yes, they hold some Bitcoin, some other things, but I don't know. We have, we have DAI if you want something truly decentralized. Um, a little bit more risky because the underlying assets are, are are a little bit more risky, but I feel like we've got kind of stable coins covered. But you know, 
anytime you put a Fortune 500 company in in a headline saying they're adopting some cryptocurrency, I'm all for it, right? So <laughs> it doesn't really matter. They, they could say they're, you know, adopting Dogecoins and, I, and I'd be like, okay, cool, let's go. You know, <laughs> yeah. just because I, I feel like that's the kind of like um, signal that a lot of companies and consumers need. Like if they hear, oh, PayPal is entering cryptocurrency, they're doing something, a stable coin in cryptocurrency, you know, other CEOs read that, um, mm. uh, other financial firms read that, you know, it's like, it's, there, it, it's a little bit of reading the tea leaves and it, and it kind of um, can create pressure to have a digital currency strategy as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that means every PayPal competitor is saying, oh, crap, we need to have a, a digital strategy, right? Like a, a digital currency strategy. So it can be a very positive thing. It's, it's interesting because like the more I think about it, the more I see like a future where it's going to be, it is going to be like chain agnostic, meaning like yeah. there's going to be multiple chains. And, and I, even with like in on the gaming side uh, where, you know, you have in-game assets and all that probably... Video games are going to have their private, their own like blockchain, private blockchains that can can act like as layer twos and you ha you'll have bridges between like video games. Is that like far away for you? Do we need like a Yuga Labs to, to start this kind of like momentum so that other video games like or companies like Valve or whatever Steam is going to move into that? Or do you think like there's com there's going to be some players that are willing to take risks for the big rewards? Yeah, I, I think it's going to take um, a breakout. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a company where all of a sudden you see one of these big gaming developers that have a hit on their hands where it's millions of people using it. You know, it's like a Roblox or, or some, some other big entity where it's like, oh, all of their digital assets are NFTs and they're absolutely crushing it and making a killing. But it's not going to be via everyone remembering a seed phrase. They're going to have their account, they're going to log in, and they won't even know. It'll be extrapolated out on the back end. It's like Redditors don't know that they even hold NFTs for the most part, right? When they're, they have those mm -hmm. different little avatars, they're not, they're not being given their seed addresses. And, you know, it's like, it's just, um, I think the technology will probably disappear into the background uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. And don't get me wrong, they'll still be the, the hardcore people that, that want that, you know, your keys, your crypto type mentality. Um, which I think is important for many reasons. Um, but I believe that most consumers, you know, will be using like a square app and be buying their cryptocurrency and just holding it there and be like, yeah, I got my crypto right here. And they just like open up their wallet and it's their face ID that gets them in. Mm -hmm. It's not because they have some kind of backed up seed phrase somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, Kevin, I just um, wanted to take a moment to acknowledge you. You know, you're at the forefront of the NFT space with Proof and the Moonbirds ecosystem. You're continuously shipping products that shine a light on top and emerging artists in space. And you're not afraid to like swing for the fences. We've seen it a couple of times where like, you know, you guys have done things that were never done before and you had to deal with some FUD that come with it. But, you know, I guess that's just the, the price that you have to pay in playing this kind of market. So, oh, for sure. Just wanted I to appreciate say, you saying that. Yeah. I wanted to say like, thank you for everything you're putting out to educate people. And personally, I've learned a ton from you over the years. Well, oh, thank you. It means a lot. And it's, it's you know, I, I think this is what life's all about, though, man. It's, it's about having fun and, and trying crazy ideas. Um, you know, my favorite, both it, to stay on the sports analogy, like two of my favorite great heroes growing up were kind of Brett Favre and Jose Canseco. And Jose Canseco mm -hmm. was like, uh, uh, you know, one of the Bash brothers, one of the home run greats, but also had, you know, just like an insane amount of strikeouts. <laughs> like. <laughs> The guy was just like, would strike out almost every time because every single time he was swinging for the fences. So right? <laughs> there was no like, uh, I want to get a single here. There was, it was no like, no, I'm going to hit a home run, right? And that's the same thing with Brett Favre. It's like, he was just like the gunslinger, like the crazy. And I've always kind of been drawn to that because it's like, it's where the excitement is and it's a lot of fun and it's also very disruptive, you know? It's like, and, and, it's, and if you get it right, it can change the world in some way. There's a lot of people out there that are fantastic entrepreneurs that are really good at kind of like, you know, taking ideas and filing down the rough edges and making very efficient businesses. And, you know, it's just not where my head is as an entrepreneur. Um, not to say I'm one of these, these, these brilliant home run crushing entrepreneurs, but I, I've always told, you know, friends and family and my wife and others that like at the end of the day, when I think about my girls, my little girls growing up. Uh, all I want them to say is that dad tried a bunch of wild things, you know, like he was a crazy That's guy. Awesome. He, he tried a bunch of wild things and 
some of it worked and some of it didn't, but you know what? No one can say he didn't try some crazy shit. So the, that, that would make me happy. Yeah. And, and talking about, uh, I mean, just last question, like talking about family and, you know, you having your little girls and all that, like how, how do you, how do you instill that into your kids? Yeah. I, I think it's kind of a, a process that I'm still learning because they're only five and four. So, but you know, I think that for me, what I do is my oldest Zelda, she's, um, she's a builder. She's like, she turns everything in the house into like building materials. And like, I just try to enable that as much as possible. So that's like me cutting up cardboard boxes to help give her more materials to do, go build crazy stuff. Um, and you know, she sometimes she gets frustrated when she can't do something like absolutely perfect and like crumbles it up and throws it away. Mm -hmm. And you know, the message I think you just need to deliver is like, you know, did you give this your all? And if the answer is yes, then there was, well, there's two, there's two things. Did you give it your all? If the answer is yes, then, then awesome. That then that's, that's what could, more could you ask for? Two is that you don't have anything to live up to. I don't care if you, you like, you know, all I want for my kids is for them to find their life's work, mm. not for them to be a billionaire. Like I, if, if their life's work is, you know, working in a library and suggesting like out of print books, like Godspeed, that sounds great, right? If that's mm. what they love to do. And so I think that's really important. Yeah, I think that's it. Those, those are the two main things, like supplying with the materials, making sure that they know that as long as they get their all, it's, it's good and just really helping them find their life's work. And I think that's kind of been where I've been leaning with them is, is if I can just like really emphasize those things, um, then, then we're good to go. I think it was on a Andrew Huberman podcast recently where he talked about long-term sustained motivation. And he said like the best way to Well, what the studies have shown is that the best way to keep motivation and to instill motivation in children is to uh, compliment them, not necessarily on them being gifted or talented, but compliment them on the effort that they're putting out. Yes, 100%. Yeah, I mean, because that's the most important piece. I always think of it in, in terms of like the, the landing of the, uh, the SpaceX rockets uh, when you watch them trying to land those on the barge and they like every, remember, remember the early days? I mean, they've gotten better yeah, now, yeah. but <laughs> in the early days, like everyone was just blowing up, you know, and they were really fun to watch because you're like, oh, here it goes, it's tipping, it's tipping, you know, and they just explode. And uh, I, I just, you know, in my head, imagine if those engineers were like, oh, damn it, it didn't work, I'm out, <laughs> I'm done, you know? Like, I, I'm not going to do another one. And, and so the reality is, is like failure is just admitting that you've learned something new, right? Like, mm. that's exactly what those engineers did. They went back, they looked at the data, they learned something new, they made a tweak, and then that, now they're landing on barges left and right. And so it's like, if you can put that into your kids and say like, hey, failure is actually a good thing. It's a necessity. Um, and not try and protect them from it, not try to shield them from it, but let them make mistakes, I think is going to be so, so useful. But that said, I, don't get me wrong. I have no doubt my kids will eventually be going to therapy for one reason or another. <laughs> it's just, it's just going to happen. Like there's always this, we're going to screw them up somehow, you know, but you know, I, I think, uh, You just got to try and take whatever mess ups my dad and mom put on me and fix those and try and pass my next best version of myself going forward. And hopefully they'll do the same thing for their kids if they decide to have them. Amen. Well, Kevin, it's been a blast having you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Same to you and um, keep up the meditation work. Glad to hear you're practicing. It's awesome. Thank you. All right, take care. Take care. 